When I talk to teams about their data architecture, an area that I like to focus on is workflow. And it's because it's an area that isn't super specific in terms of a specific tool or a specific line of code that you can write, but more about a strategy and process in the middle. It's a little bit more gray, but it's something that's incredibly important, especially for teams looking to migrate to a more modern approach. And so what I wanna talk about in this video are some examples of what I think about, at least when I say workflow, and some things that you can think about whether you're looking to build or upgrade something you have in place. So the first thing that comes to mind for me when I'm thinking about workflow is environments. It's something that over the last five to 10 years has become a lot more prominent, I would say. Typically people will have a development and their production environment, but nowadays it's really important to have also something in the middle. For example, something like a CI, continuous integration, or maybe you'll call it a test environment or a UAT. This aligns a lot with what software developers have historically pretty much always done, but for some reason, data people, we just didn't do this for a long time. And even today, there are a lot of teams, especially smaller ones that don't have some sort of separation of environments. So they'll have some code, but it might just go straight to production. You know, you save something and immediately everybody can see it. But having environments is really important to keep things structured and avoid introducing bugs that you didn't expect. So this is an area I focus on a lot with teams when I'm working with them. And there are really three foundational environments I always recommend. The first environment I typically will just call development. And this is a safe space for each developer, or even if it's just one person on the team to develop and build and drop things without impacting anybody else and without impacting the production live version of things. And this is something I recommend still doing, even if you're just the only person on the team, you're a one person data team, having these environments and separation keeps you organized and helps set you up for a future where maybe somebody else is going to help you, but it's just good practice. So development is one, then there's, I'm just gonna jump ahead to production, right? So this is the live version of everything that your users are seeing, that stakeholders see, it's connected to reports, it's updated every day production. But in the middle, there's another environment that would be considered like a test environment. You can call this different things. You can call it CI, which stands for continuous integration. You could call it test UAT, which is user area testing. It doesn't really matter what you call it. It's this idea of something in the middle. It's taking what you had in your development environment and testing it one more time, maybe through some automations and through just a, another check before it gets to production. And one final note on this is naming conventions. That's super important when it comes to environments because it's possible that you'll have the same objects in different environments. So you wanna make sure that you have things isolated and named clearly. So for example, schemas might be prefixed a certain way or the roles might have a specific naming convention. You wanna make sure it all ties together. So those three environments, it sounds basic when you say it out loud, but this is something that a lot of teams miss. And I think part of the reason this becomes difficult is because it doesn't fit one specific tool, it blends between them. This is what I'm saying, it's part of the glue of your architecture. And so it's really important. And so environments, number one, are a big part of workflow. Now, the second note I have here is Git development. And Git is a process for managing the history and changes of your code base. And a lot of tools in the data world nowadays are code based, and even the ones that aren't have some element of version control with them. And a lot of tools that help Manages are gonna be things like GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, Azure DevOps, there's a bunch of others, but under the hood, they're all still managing what are known as Git projects. Now I'm not gonna cover what that is, I have other videos on that, but what I wanna mention here is the workflow aspect of this is really important. At a high level, you're going to have a main branch of some sort that's, let's call it production, but then when you're looking to develop new changes or fix a bug of some sort, you'll create a separate branch and make those changes there and go through a process of what's called merging it to the main branch. Again, I don't wanna to get too lost in the tactical parts of Git workflow, but it's the idea of having a process for how you do that. Some teams will have very particular conventions for what every branch should be named so that it can tie into other aspects of their tooling and whatnot. But it's the idea still that you have a branch. And with that, the idea of committing changes to the branch. One of the things that I was taught early in my Git introduction of my career was to commit early and often. You don't wanna have too many changes build up before you commit. And committing to me, you can think of it like saving your changes if you're not used to that. So the idea of committing frequently is encouraged because now you're gonna have track changes of very specific things. If you ever need to go back and undo something, it's easy to pick things out. You can add little comments around those particular changes. And I also call this out because this is an area I find a lot of developers tend to let their changes build and they'll have one massive commit of a bunch of changes. And this might seem like an easier move in the moment because you don't have to worry about 
creating all these different commits and all these different commit messages, but you make it a lot harder for yourself to pick apart individual changes. And even one particular file or line of code could go through multiple iterations of changes. And sometimes it's helpful to see those changes because maybe you wanna go back in the future or maybe you're unsure. So again, when it comes to workflow, this Git process is super important. And it's something that I find particularly small teams overlook or try to get lazy with. It's really important to stay diligent with it, even if it's just you on the team. The reality is you need to be able to hold yourself accountable. Even if you have a version controlled project, it's not really helping you if you're just saving directly to main every single time or going around this process. You're missing half of the value here. And again, this is all part of that workflow, setting good foundations for not only you, but for the future of your project. So keep yourself honest with this process. And then number three is automations. And this is kind of putting a bow on what we just talked about. So environments and Git development. The automation piece helps you tie it all together. So a couple notes on this. Number one is pull requests checks, or you might hear called merge requests in different platforms. And this is the process of when you are doing that Git workflow, you are now introducing a request to merge what's called merge those changes in, you can kick off some automations. And this is where again, that workflow of the Git process and the environments is all coming together because you create a new request, it triggers an automation to let's say deploy those changes to that testing environment. You've been doing all this hopefully in your dev environment, but now it's doing it again as a separate check in this pre-production environment. And you can have it deploy, you can have it run tests, you can customize this however you want, but it's that idea of including that in the workflow. And this is where you'll see that term CI, CD, because it's CI is continuous integration. It's that process of allowing you to continuously make changes and test it in this pre-production environment automatically. So you don't necessarily even have to wait for some big release night to release changes, you can do it continuously. Again, CICD, continuous integration and deployment. Now, if you've only been in the data world for a few years, this might seem really normal and commonplace. I remember when I first got into data and some software development before that, everything would be saved up for some big release night and we'd all be at the office until 10 o'clock midnight waiting to release something and test it live at that moment before everybody came back into the office. And it was this whole big thing. Everybody would get their changes and push it through at the same time. And this is a completely different, more flexible and faster paced type of concept. And when this first started happening in the data world, I remember thinking this was not possible. I don't know how people are doing this. It seemed like some magic trick, but now it's not only commonplace, but pretty much expected to have some sort of process like that. When you have this type of automation in place, you can get changes from development to production in as little as under an hour. It's really incredible. So just to recap here, we talked about environments, Git development, and automations. And when you put all of these things together, it really helps you establish a nice workflow for your data development. It may not be something you can get done overnight, but it is something that I highly recommend going towards. And if you are leading a small team, or maybe you are the only person on your team and you need some help setting something like this up, I'll leave a link in the description below where you can learn a little bit more about how I might be able to help you with this. But either way, thanks as always for watching and I'll see you at the next video.